Hello, good morning, and welcome to our Math and Science show. I'm Math Dad, and this is Science Mom. Today we are talking about microwaves. How microwaves work. We're going to learn how microwaves work, and we're also going to learn a little bit more about averages and some cool math things as well. But first, I want to give a quick welcome to those of you who are watching live. A special welcome to you if you're watching the replay. Hello to Space Queen from Washington, Melissa from Michigan, Queen Adar from Minnesota, Ember, Melanie from California, and Labrin, and Marco, and Queen Dona, and Julie. It is so wonderful to have you joining us here. Hello to Christine from Georgia, and to Brian and Elizabeth, and Science Cat. We have so many answers flooding up in the chat right now. It's a little hard to, to keep track, but I want you to know that we really appreciate you joining us for this math and science lesson. Before we start talking about microwaves, I want to show you that our art prompt for yesterday and share just a couple submissions. Yesterday, it was to draw your dream house. We're gonna share just five pictures and then we'll have another art showcase at the end. Queen Poppy, got to Minecraft here. Yes, so we have, and Math Dad, you said that your dream house would definitely have a secret passage, right? Yes. So excellent Minecraft house here. And then I love all the different labels of the rooms here and that there are flying fish and magical towers. Nicely done. And I love all the animals in that's, the other one. That's even better than my house. <laughs> and a pool. Here's an excellent Minecraft house. <laughs> Nicely done. Oh. And a three-dimensional house. It's not like a swimming pool up it on does. the second level of a house. That is so cool. Yeah. Swimming, swimming pool in a house is a fantastic idea. Why didn't we do that in our house? <laughs> one more drawing for our morning art show. Great work, Kylie. And I love the animals here and the mountains and the scenery because you know what they say about, about houses, location, 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 right? Yeah. That's what science mom cares about. They could <laughs> just put her in a beautiful place. She doesn't care what the inside of the house looks like. Yeah. She's, I'm she's all, about, all, about the all about the surroundings. Every, every day we do have a art prompt and an engineering prompt, and we'll be telling you more about the ones for, for tomorrow in just a minute. But Let's start off with talking just a little bit about how science works, because when you are learning something in science, there are often levels of understanding. Yesterday, we talked about vacuums, and I have a little question, kind of a trick question for you. We're going to do a quick demo with a vacuum. Ooh. So I have here, Math Dad, if you'll be my assistant and hold that, I have a tray. There's a plastic bag on the tray, and there's just a little bit of water in the plastic bag so that then when I put this jar over the top, if there is lower pressure in the jar, if I have a partial vacuum in the jar, then it will seal to, because this bag that's partly filled with water will kind of come up and meet it and I'll get a really good seal. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to light these candles and then I'm going to put the jar out over the top. Now what's gonna happen when I put a jar over the top of candles? Um, it'll eat up the air. That's right. right? They'll they'll go, the, the they'll oxygen, go out rather because the candles need oxygen to burn, and as soon as I put a jar over them, they're gonna go out. Now, Surprise! This is, is really just a happy birthday. It's happy birthday to you! <laughs> and hopefully, I pushed down hard enough. Having Math Dad hold this, we will find out in just a moment if it worked. So here, back up just a little, Math Dad, so they can see. This tray is fairly heavy. Do you think that I would be able to lift up the tray just holding on to the jar? Let us know in the chat what you think. So there wouldn't be any magnets or anything. It's no, just, it's just no the negative involved. pressure. And we'll even put some extra weight here. We will add a dragon. Well, that was BB brave eight, to do before we even try it. <laughs> a kangaroo and a, a beaver. And now here's the moment of truth. All right, math dad, I want you to let go. Oh, and the dragon, we lost the dragon. But it worked. if we put him on sideways, then he stays. Oh, I'm holding up this entire tray just by holding on to this jar. And you guys saw, I did not glue the jar down. The reason that the jar is staying attached to this tray is because there's a partial vacuum in the jar. I heated up the air so hot those molecules were spread out really far because of the flame. And then, hey, you're not supposed to be holding that. Oh, sorry, I was ready to take it. <laughs> ready to take it? Look at this. It is really stuck on. If I wanna get it off, I'm gonna be able to, but it's gonna be really hard. And my question for you is, what is happening here? Is the vacuum sucking the plate up 
or is air around the vacuum pushing this jar onto the plate? So I want you to say push or pull depending on your vote. So I've got two theories here to explain this. Theory number one is that vacuums have suction. And this partial vacuum here is pulling this plate up and it is keeping it attached. Theory number two is that vacuums do not have suction, but the air pressure around this vacuum, it wants, it, it wants things and to be below. balanced and yeah. below. The air pressure around and below, it wants things to be balanced and it's pushing against this space where the pressure is lower. So while they think about that real quick, I just want, you, you keep using the term partial vacuum. So you're, you're saying it's not like- there's, there's, there's still a little, there's still air in here. There's just not as much air in here as there is out here. So in particular, only the oxygen burned or? No, no, so they, the oxygen was used up, but what happened was that the air was so hot above the candles that when I put the cup down, I trapped a lot of hot air. And then when the air cooled, that pressure, uh -huh. dro it, it dropped the pressure a lot because the because air got Because it had expanded when it, it was expanded. warm. It expanded. And then, then it, as it contracts, as it cools, yeah, it, oh, it, that it, makes it, more it sense. wanted to shrink down more than it could because of the jar. So I hope that you have voted for your theory. You either say push in the chat if you think that it is the air pressure that is making this work, or say pull if you think it is the vacuum having suction and pulling up the lid. So looking at the chat here, I would say that the pulls have it. So we're seeing more pulls than we are pushes, but push is actually correct. Mm. This is one of the most common misconceptions that people have. And it, you can understand why, because it seems kind of intuitive. Most people, I would say the majority of people think that vacuums produce suction. But the vacuum, especially if this was a complete vacuum, it would be empty space. Are we gonna have any force coming from empty space, being produced by empty space? No, the force is coming from the air pressure around us because air, I made a little drawing here, if I can find it. Air is made up of all of these molecules. And if you spread these out, whoop, there we go. It finally, finally I was wiggling it enough that we got a little bit of an air, air bubble going in and I was able to take it off. So if your air molecules are super spread out, then there's not as much pressure. If they are closer together, there is, they're closer together, there's more pressure, more interactions. And if you heat air up, it spreads out. That's how we made that little partial vacuum. But around that jar, guess what we had? A whole bunch of air, a whole bunch of pressure that wants things to be balanced. And so that what was, is what was keeping the jar on. If we had our jar and that plate being held up, and then we moved into outer space where there was a complete vacuum. Would it would it still be attached? No, because um, no, there'd be no. more pressure inside than out. Yeah, right? it would actually go and it would pop off because there would be more air inside the so cup. I, I've got to say this is really weird to think about because I always think of a vacuum cleaner as sucking up the stuff, but it turns out it's not doing the sucking, the stuff just, just leaping in because of the, the Lo lower, lack of pressure. Lower pressure. Lower pressure. Man. I, I think it works to think of a vacuum cleaner as sucking <laughs> because of like the way that the currents of air work. Sure, like, yeah. There is, but an actual vacuum, a vacuum of empty space does not provide suction. So All right. when we're talking about microwaves today, I want to point out that there are layers of understanding to how we understand things in science. We're going to kind of go into the first couple layers but there are even more and stranger mysteries waiting to be discovered if you dive deeper. And sometimes when you dive deeper, you realize that the way you understood on top was a little bit incorrect. That happens fairly often. Indeed. Same thing happens in math, layers upon layers. So you ready to have your minds blown? Our first thing that we need to address when talking about microwaves is that there is no such thing as cold. I'm being completely serious I, I've here. I've been cold before. What you have experienced is the absence of heat. There is no such thing as cold, there is just the absence of heat. And what we're talking about is how matter is moving. So when you have molecules, like our little, our little molecules here in air, when you have molecules moving around, they're vibrating. The faster they're moving, the more energy they have, the hotter they are. And so you can have things moving really fast or they can slow down and have less heat. And when they have less heat, they're colder, but there's not actually 
cold. There's just heat or the absence of heat. So when we're talking about microwaves, we're talking about ways to heat things up and we're going to be exploring radiation. Mm -hmm. Now, Math Dad, I have a little question for you and for those of you who are watching live in the chat, when we're talking about radiation, we're talking about lots of different types of radiation and the way that we understand them is that they are waves. So you have this energy that is cycling up and down and how fast it's going, not how fast it's going, I should say how steep those curves are in the wave, that's what makes it one type or another. So let's start out with our lowest type of energy, radio waves. Would you be scared of radio waves, Math Dad? I am not scared of radio waves. Are they dangerous? Um, nope. That's... Are they passing through you right now? Probably. Are you feeling anything from them? I am not. Nope. Radio waves are quite safe and they really don't interact with us at all. Their energy is very low, but we can use them to send information. You can send signals, you can play songs, and pass that information all around the world using this very low frequency wave. How about shorter radio waves? Uh, Still not, radio waves, but they're shorter. Also not worried. Oh, these are microwaves. This is what uh, we'll be talking about in just a minute. But let's keep going. Oh, maybe I should be worried then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that in a minute. How about infrared radiation? Um, maybe a little scared. I don't know. Infrared radiation Good. is heat. You are making infrared radiation right now. If we had a thermal camera and turned it on, you would see that Math Dad and I would look kind of yellowish and our noses would look a little bit um, more bluish because our noses tend to be colder than the rest of our face. And you could actually look at yourself with a thermal imaging camera and you could see the heat that you're producing. We're very talented. Now, how about visible light? Light that you can see. Are you afraid of this type of radiation? No, I am not. This type of radiation is pretty safe too. So, so far we have been pretty safe with the types of radiation we're experiencing. What about UV light? Sunburns. Yes, sunburns. And notice how our waves are getting a little more energetic and the distance between the top of the waves is getting shorter. What about x-rays? So those, I know you've got to cover up and be careful because it can even cause cancer. Like, yes. There's some danger there. And I'm seeing in the chat too, x-rays you need to be careful with. They can be super useful. Like if you have a broken bone, you want to know where it's broken, take an x-ray, you can see your bones. But if you are exposed to too many x-rays, then you can get radiation poisoning. They can make you very sick. How about gamma rays? And this is supposed to be like a mushroom cloud from a nuclear, nuclear explosion. explosion. Yeah, it I'm, looks I'm, kinda I'm like guessing those are pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Those are really bad. So this is the most intense type of radiation this is super dangerous, produced by our sun, also produced by things like nuclear explosions. And if you get exposed to even just a little bit of this, it's game over. Now, you went through cancer treatments and got some radiation in a specific area. I did. Is that I, I had radiation therapy, and my radiation therapy was in between these two. A bit stronger than an x-ray, not quite as dangerous as a gamma ray. Just a little bit, though. Right? And yeah, the amounts were very measured, very targeted and it was just over kind of this area of my body. And I got a very bad sunburn as a result. <laughs> yep. And, and it's true, I saw in the chat several people saying that my gamma radiation drawing totally looks like a tree. It does. <laughs> just, just imagine mushroom cloud from nuclear explosion, <laughs> even though it looks like a tree. A little, little different. So back to microwaves. There are some really interesting things with microwaves. This machine is a marvel of engineering and it's something that most people have in their houses to heat food. Now, are microwaves dangerous, Math Dad? Um, clearly, you wouldn't want to climb inside a microwave oven and turn it on, so I'm going to say yes, but then it was down in all that safe area, so I'm going to want to say no. It really depends. It really depends. So the microwave is the actual radiation being produced by your microwave. It's very controlled and it's between 2.45 gigahertz, and it's actually quite safe. It, as long as like you're not inside the microwave, it's really quite safe. And if a tiny bit of it escapes, it's not going to be able to penetrate very deep into your, into your tissue, and it is fairly safe, but. So, and, and I just want to clarify, so a hertz is the, the number of cycles per second, and so 2.45, gigahertz, well giga, then we're talking about billions, so this is 2 so billion, 450 million cycles per second. So. It's oscillating, going up, yeah, very, very fast. But 
the microwave has some components in it that are very dangerous. So I will say, if your microwave ever breaks, you should not try to fix it yourself. If you ever have a broken microwave or like find one in a dumpster, you should not take it apart to see how it works because there are a couple components in particular that can be incredibly dangerous if they are not handled the right way. So in our microwave and on the notes today, there's a little handout here. What happens and how a microwave works is that you have power from your outlet that goes into the transformer. That's that first little box there. And the transformer takes that power and converts it into a type that your, that your microwave can then use. Then it goes to the capacitor, which sort of stores it so that then you always have the right amount of energy going to the magnetron. And the magnetron is the real, is the real deal that makes the microwave work. Sorry, I lost my other, my other drawing. So let's take a look at a little drawing of the magnetron. The magnetron, as you may have guessed, has magnets. So purple magnet here, purple magnet there. I drew them purple in real life, they are not purple. But you have permanent magnets around this chamber and inside the chamber is a vacuum. And if we were to look at a cross section and there's a little rod going up in the middle of the chamber, in this vacuum chamber, you've got that rod in the middle that creates an electrical current and it excites electrons and electrons come off of that rod in the middle and then you get kind of a star-shaped pattern as they spiral around inside the magnetron. And that is the device that makes the microwaves. And then they are guided out through a waveguide and there's a little kind of a fan up top inside the microwave box that you don't see that scatters them. And when it scatters those microwaves, there's something special about that frequency of 2.54 gigahertz. That is the frequency that will make water vibrate. And so when the microwaves are scattered, the water starts to vibrate. And if you just have one microwave come through, the water will be like, ooh, I'm a charged particle. I want to line up with this and it will change direction. But since you are having millions of microwaves coming through and changing the way that they're coming through, the water molecules start to vibrate. And they vibrate so quickly that you get heat being formed. If you put frozen water in the microwave, frozen water is locked in a crystal structure. Frozen water or ice, can't, those molecules can't move because they are locked with bonds to the other water molecules. And if you take just straight ice and put it in the microwave, you can microwave it for quite a while and it's not going to change very much. And this is why when you put things in on defrost, the defrost setting on your microwave is not 50% less power. It's actually 50% less time on. And you'll hear it if you put something in the microwave and then put the defrost setting on, you'll hear that the microwave runs and then it the turntable is still going, but it actually shuts off and then it runs again, and then it shuts off, and runs again, and shuts off. And each time it shuts off, it's letting the tiny little bit of water that defrosted, it's letting that kind of pass heat to other parts and thaw, and then when it comes on again, it melts just that, you know, that little melted water will heat up and melt other ice, and that's how the defrost button works. Kind of cool, right? That is really cool. cool. So if you want that experiment, we're not gonna demonstrate because it's just not very visual and exciting, but it is cool to see. So if you have ice at home, you can put ice in the microwave and you can see that it does not melt very much at all if you take it straight out of the freezer. But if you take an ice cube that has a little bit of wet water around it, it will melt very quickly because it's the wet water, the liquid water that does the heating up. But if they instead take the ice cube and put it on the defrost setting, then it will melt? It, it takes time because you have to wait to get enough liquid water that then it heats up. We just had a little catastrophe over here, but it's okay. We'll recover. <laughs> All right. I want to take just a couple questions and talk about what you should not put in a microwave. And then we are going to measure the speed of light using chocolate in our microwave over here. If you don't have chocolate, you can use anything else where you can see a difference between what is warmed up and what's not warmed up. So if you have cheese, you could grate a whole plate of cheese and lay it over a tray. If you have bread and butter, you could put thick butter over bread and then you'll be able to see where it's melting and where it's not yet melting. And you can do the same thing. Now, why? Oh, great question here. What would happen if you put something in the microwave that didn't have any water? It would not heat up very much at all. 
There are a few other molecules that will also resonate with microwaves, but in general, it's only charged particles and water is charged. It has, it's a polar molecule. So it has slightly negative charge up here, slightly positive charge down here. And so the microwaves are only gonna react with charged particles and water. And if you have something in there that's you know completely dehydrated, like maybe some sort of like a, I don't know, space food that's completely dehydrated and freeze dried and doesn't have any water in it, you could put it in there for a minute and when you take it out, it might warm up just the tiniest bit, but it's not gonna be very hot because the microwaves are just gonna pass through and they're not going to cause that motion. So water is the main thing that is causing heat in a microwave. But I said charged particles react with microwaves and you guys know that metal is something that has a lot of electrons that are free to move around. Metal is an excellent con conductor of electricity. If you put perfectly smooth metal in a microwave, that has no rough edges whatsoever, you actually don't see much happen. But if almost all metal that we encounter in real life has a rough edge somewhere, and if you put metal with rough edges in a microwave, it will cause a spark. And once you get a spark, a spark in a microwave is a very dangerous thing because now you have a tiny little bit of plasma. You have some ionized particles, and then those will cause other things to ionize, and you will get like a mini little fireball in your microwave. So do not ever put metal in a microwave. If you do accidentally, you know, like you're really tired in the morning and you put your bowl of oatmeal in the, in the microwave and you have a spoon in there, as long as you turn it off real quick, your metal will be hot, but your microwave and your food will be just fine. It's still safe to eat. Your microwave will be undamaged, but it does not take very long. You know, we're talking 15, 20 seconds of having something metal in your microwave. You could actually break and ruin your microwave. And microwaves are expensive enough. You do not want to do that. <clears throat> there are, and I mean, if you start exploring online, you will find a lot of not safe experiments to do in a microwave that produce interesting results. But I want everyone who is watching, <clears throat> excuse me, I want everyone who is watching to say with me, say, I promise I will not ruin my microwave. If you are a kid watching, especially say it, let's say it all together. I, I promise, promise I will, I will not, not ruin, ruin my, my microwave. microwave. So no CDs in the microwave. No creating plasma on purpose in your microwave, whether it's using grapes or using light bulbs. No metal in the microwave, no tinfoil in the microwave. You want your microwave to still be around to work to clean up food. And you especially don't want your microwave to break because there are, there are dangerous components in it. So we talked about the capacitor and the transformer. Those, um, you never want to take apart a microwave because those could be dangerous. But in the magnetron, we actually have Oh, where is it? We have some beryllium. I had another little drawing, but it's kind of lost. We have beryllium in the magnetron and that can be very, very poisonous. So if you were ever to take apart a magnetron and you didn't know what you were doing and you accidentally got exposed to that element, you could actually, you could die or you could have health problems for the rest of your life. So microwaves are really cool machines. We use them all the time. Never take one apart. Don't put metal in your microwave. Yes, no? yes ma'am. Now should we do the chocolate? All right, and let's, then let's do this. We'll, we'll take we'll take just a couple a couple more couple more questions in a minute. Do we want to explain it first? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to and oh. quick shout out and thank you to everyone. I see the chat is just filling up with people saying, "I promise I will not ruin my microwave," oh. and I'm very happy to see that. I didn't say the right. Just a sec. I Math Dad made a really cool Desmos activity. And it looks like he accidentally. Oops, that's the wrong code. That's yes, last time's code. I didn't save it. There we go. So here is the the code if you want to do this at home. So C E G G eight three. What I'm going to do is jump over to another screen to, to show you what this activity looks like. All right. So. Let's jump into my student view here. All right, what we're seeing here is what we call a stationary wave. And it's, it's stationary, and that means it's just going up and down, but it's kind of staying in place. You're not seeing it move side to side. And that in particular, if you look at those black dots that are there, what you're seeing is points that don't move. 
They call this a standing wave or a stationary wave. And what it's caused by is when two waves intersect each other, you end up adding the heights at each of the points and it creates, they, they kind of cancel each other out if they have the same uh, frequency and, and amplitude, they will kind of cancel each other out in a way that creates a standing wave. Like that all right so in particular I, I can even show you what those waves look like so that green wave and that blue wave when they combine they're actually making that red wave Ooh. so okay kind of fancy to, to see that that is quite fancy man I'm, I'm impressed all right, all right. thank you <laughs> all right so what we're seeing though is that the period is going to be the distance between two successive peaks and those black dots are actually just one half of a period apart. That's going to be important for our calculation in a minute because we're actually going to try to calculate the speed of light. And we're going to use these stationary waves, and in particular, these black points where it's actually stationary. If a microwave is radiating specific points, then those points should be getting really hot. And that's actually why the microwave comes with that turntable. Yeah. So that it's not getting hot in just one spot. If you try to run something in your microwave and you don't have it on a turntable of some sort, well, it's going to get hot in some spots and not in others because the, those, those hot spots where the, the waves are, are constant there. Are, and, and if you have an old microwave, you might notice that you get interesting patterns of hot and cold. And that's probably related more to the, the, the guide ray that goes out and then the fan that scatters the microwaves. If that fan is not working as well, then you can have all of your microwaves concentrated in one area and then another area doesn't get warmed up at all. But most microwaves, if you take out your turntable or flip it over and then lay things down so that they're not turning, you will be able to find these hotter and cooler spots. And then you can use those to measure the wavelength, which is really cool. And this is what we're going to try right now. All right. And yes, we've taken the turntable out of our microwave because we, we, we want to identify well, where are those uh, hot spots. And so oh, and we will we will just bring it right here and and show you. And actually I think if we scoot this back, well no. We're gonna all right. So here is our microwave and we took our turntable and turned it upside down so that then we could turn it on and it wouldn't be rotating at all. And now, did you get the waxed parchment paper? Little piece of parchment paper here. And we are going to put our chocolate bar in the microwave for just a few no, seconds. No, 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 that's on a plate. Oh, it's upside down. You're right. It's upside down. Okay. Yep. And I will tell you, Math Dad and I are a little nervous because we haven't ever tried this before. We really hope it works. That's, that's very true. Although I've read in multiple places that this works. Multiple just places, fine, so. it has told us that that we can that we can do it. All right. And then I'm looking through this window here to just try and try and see. My, my, my guess was 10 seconds that we should stop and check. All right, 10 seconds. We will stop and check. Ooh. We have we have a melty spot. See? Uh-huh. And we have another melty spot. And then in between, it is solid. So we are good to go. All right. So unfortunately, that's a pretty wide band, that melty spot that we're seeing there. You can see where science mom kind of stuck her fingers in. And way over at this end, I'm seeing another melty spot. So what we're going to try to do is measure the distances between those melty spots. And I've got my trusty ruler. Yep, I'll move you back up here. Right. And again, you don't have to use chocolate. If you don't have any chocolate at home, anything where you can microwave it for a few seconds and see the difference between melted and not melted, anything will work. So you can use right. some cheese. You could use bread and butter. So if I go from the end to the center of the melty spot, it, it looks to me like it's about, <coughs> you guys can't even see this. What am I? Yeah, it looks like it's about, so I'm seeing 12 centimeters there. And that's two. So it uh, looks like about six centimeters between the successive melty spots. That does look pretty close. Yeah. Right, that, that, that. 
Unfortunately, I was hoping we'd be getting a more accurate estimate, but that melty spot is a couple centimeters wide. It got so. pretty big pretty fast. If yeah. you have multiple chocolate bars, you can try again and do less, or if you have cheese or something else. But I think if we go from middle to middle, six and a half. I think it's six and a half centimeters. Okay. Well, if you go from the middle of one to the middle of another. All right. We, we, we will try this. And I okay. think center of melty spot to center of melty spot is how you want to measure. That makes sense. All right. So I'm going to jump back over and open up our Desmos activity. All right. So if I move to the very next screen, we have here how, how many, many centimeters did it measure? Six and a half. Okay, so 6.5 is what Science Mom says. Okay, and now the gigahertz of our microwave is 2.45. There's a 99% chance, I think, that your microwave will probably have the, the same rating. But some microwaves are more powerful. Yeah, so I've, I've listed that number there, although you can change it if it turns out that your microwave has different settings. But yeah, so we double the distance between those successive points to get an entire cycle. And then, well, there we just said there were 2,450,000,000 uh, cycles per second. Whoa, that's so, a lot. So, and then, but then we have, this is the number of centimeters. So we'd have to then divide by 100 to convert to meters. And it worked out, we've estimated that the speed of light is 318, um, Million. M 500,000 meters per second. Oh, crap, did I add extra? Is, is it million? Uh oh. No, gotta just be careful. No, no. Yeah, yeah. So m meters per second. No, that's that's right. I'm thinking, I was thinking kilometers. I was like, ah, we're off by three digits, but okay. <laughs> no, no. Okay. So the speed of light is yes, 300,000 kilometers or 300 yeah. million meters per second. So okay. We were, <sighs> we were within the ballpark. The actual speed of light is 299 yeah. million ish meters per second so we were close yeah so su is... super cool or you know what you could do is work backwards we could have actually figured out how many gigahertz our microwave was Ooh. just by because speed of light is something that could be looked up and then you could work backwards and figure out the, what your microwave what setting. gigahertz your microwave has that's pretty cool all right i want to take answer some questions about microwaves and then we will move on to fact or fiction. So let us know what questions you have about microwaves. And I see, <coughs> I saw a couple good ones that Science Mom Emily, oh, one was, why is it bad to put plastic in the microwave? It all depends on what type of plastic it is. So certain types of plastic are called food safe. They're food safe plastic because they're not gonna break down and leak smaller little plastic particles into the food that then you are going to eat. There are certain types of plastic that you do not wanna be consuming and putting inside your body because there are health effects that are not good with those small little particles. So if the plastic is food grade plastic, which is what most Tupperwares and things are made out of, then it's just fine to put in the microwave and, and it can get hot and it's not gonna leak little particles in. But the plastic in like a grocery bag or, you know, maybe or other types of plastic that are flimsier, if you have food wrapped in that type of plastic and you heat it up, there is the chance that you could have small little plastic particles once they heat up kind of breaking off and getting in your food. And that's the concern with putting plastic in the microwave. Why is the microwave made out of metal? That is a great question. And I want to point out the screen that you see when you look in a microwave to see what's going on on the inside. You will notice that it looks like there are these little, like there's a grid. There are metal filaments that go across the screen to trap the radiation inside so that it's not going out and passing through the glass. And then the walls of the microwave are all made out of metal to make sure to reflect those microwaves and keep them in the box, contain them in the box. But, but maybe even more importantly, remember how the waves needed to cancel each other out to get the standing parts that really heated up? Well, that won't happen if the waves just go off so that they're bouncing back. Back and, and forth. That, that's what's giving us our hotspots. Yep. Um, good question here. What would happen if you put gold in a microwave? Any type of metal that you put in a microwave, and it doesn't matter um, too much what type it is, but any type of metal has the, the possibility of creating a tiny spark. And once you have a spark, you can get a little plasma fireball. And it's not just metal. It's also really small objects. And I, I guess the last thing that I want to talk about is, do microwaves cook things from the inside out or from the outside in? 
Mm. And the answer is it all depends on the size of the object. Microwaves are not able to penetrate very deep. If you put, let's say you put a block of cheese in the microwave that is this big, then when you turn it on, the inside of that block of food is not going to be getting hot. Or maybe I should have just said block of water because water is a little easier to picture. If you put a huge container of water in there, then the inside is not going to get hot until the outside layer gets hot and transfers heat through. Now with a liquid, once you start to get heat around the outside, you can get convection and the liquid moving. But with something that is solid, more solid, it does heat usually from the outside in. And it's the transfer of heat from the outside. Molecules that are getting hot because the microwaves only penetrate maybe about two centimeters or so that, that makes it heat up. But if you have something very small, like a grape or you know a tiny little water bead, then it's actually just the right size for the wavelength that you get a cool interference pattern happening and the inside heats up hotter than the outside. So it depends depends on the size. I wanted to see if Science Mom can, and I can make a standing <coughs> wave. We're going to try this. I don't know how well it will work. but Pretty poorly. We tried it this morning, and it wasn't working very well. No, okay, so but we're brave, so we'll try over it again. So that they, they're seeing, ah, this rope right, <laughs> right in the middle here. So you just hold your end still. I'm holding it nice and tight. And let's... All right, I think we I think we got a we sort of got two waves going there. I don't know how well that's coming across on the camera. Our yeah. rope is brightly flavored colored, but if you have a longer rope, especially one that's a little thicker, sometimes you can get really cool patterns just by waving the rope up and down. That's right. And then get a stationary point that's not actually moving. Uh, that's a little trickier, but Oh, and and here's a good question. So if the microwave is made of metal, why doesn't the microwave malfunction? Like why don't you have plasma sparks happening? all the time everywhere. And it has to do with, you know, you have to have a rough surface to get a plasma spark. And if you look at the inside of your microwave, there are, there's metal, but it's been coated in a way that it's very smooth. And the metal that is behind that coating does a good job of bouncing the waves, but because it is coated with that special covering, you're not ever going to have a rough surface on that metal because it's protected and covered by the, the coating on the inside of the microwave. That's a great question. All right, should we do- Fact or fiction? Fact or fiction. All right, science mom, are you ready for this? I am ready. Fact or fiction, a cow can produce over 50 kilograms of milk in a day. Uh, 50 kilograms? Yeah, it's possible for a cow to produce 50 kilograms of milk can you, in a day. Can you tell me what that is in gallons? Because I feel like I think, I think better, I'm blaming this on my American upbringing, but I just think better in the English system. All right, so there'd be like 110, pounds and so that that would be wow that'd be like 20 gallons 20 gallons so i've seen dairy cows and they have pretty big udders and oh, they get milked twice a day no 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 that's let me let me revise that calculation that's not something like i'm seeing a lot 15, of trues i'm gonna go with 15 true. 14 gallons but that's a lot 14 gallons that's a lot of milk but i'm gonna say true that that is true so thank you to the chat <laughs> <laughs> on, on average, cows don't give that much milk. I, instead, it's going to be closer to maybe 60 kilograms. I'm sorry. Nothing. I, I'm, I'm also thinking pounds. So I grew up on a farm. We, we didn't measure things in kilograms, but I kind of wish we had. It would have been more like 30 kilograms per day. So maybe half of, of what I had claimed. Although on our farm, we totally had a cow that would give that much milk. The milk inspector would come and I'd always just be watching. Ooh, how much is he going to give this time? And Man, could she give a lot of... That's just Dragon Milk's daughter is the record holder on our farm. I told you about Dragon Milk, <laughs> my cow. Well, this was her daughter. Did, did Dragon Milk's daughter have a name or just a number? Uh, actually, she's, we went by a number. Yeah, very few cows got, got names. Got actual names. Almost. Usually it was like number 410 or number whatever. That's right. All right. Fact or fiction. True or false? <laughs> a cheetah can roar louder than a lion. I don't think cheetahs roar. That's my like initial just kind of... But I'm basing that solely off of nature documentaries, and I have seen lions roar in nature documentaries, and I have not ever seen a cheetah roar. But that doesn't necessarily mean that cheetahs don't roar. Are you saying false? Uh, I'm saying that I'm not yet done talking, and <laughs> she's stalling to look at what the chat says. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also saying that cats tend to be fairly vocal, so it would stand to reason that cheetahs do make sounds. I'm gonna go with false. Okay, uh, it, it's uh, totally false. Yeah, che <laughs> cheetahs do not roar. They, uh, the, there are only like four types of cats that do roar. We've got 
lions, tigers, leopards, jaguars, and that they have this bone with two different components to it that allows them to make that roaring sound. All other cats only have one component to that particular bone, hyoid or something. That's fascinating. So yeah, ne never heard of it before, but um, yeah, re really fascinating. It so cheetahs can kind of bark and make, make weird purring sounds. It, yeah, they're really interesting. We'll go look up a clip. What does cheetah sound like? It's kind of fun. Huh. All right. Okay, true or false? Eating sugar can give you wrinkles. Okay, that's a weird one. So I would say loss of collagen in your skin is what gives you wrinkles. I don't know why eating sugar would have anything to do with that. Um, you're gonna wait, you're waiting for the chat. Oh. Yeah, all right, I'm gonna say false. Um, oh no, I'm seeing a bunch of trues. Yeah, it, it actually is true. It, it doesn't play a huge role. So apparently if you get excess of sugars, it will, the process was called glycation and it will kind of make the collagen more brittle which will, over time will, of course, cause wrinkles as it weakens the, the, the collagen. So, Although I'm sure it doesn't have nearly as strong effect no. as like sun exposure, because UV sun will also like increase, like someone who has a lot of UV sun exposure will have more wrinkles than someone who doesn't. Yeah, so, so it's just a super small effect. Super small effect. But it's a le legit effect. So if you're looking for an excuse to try and quit sugar, there you go. Seriously, I mean, <laughs> can you deal with those wrinkles? That, that, that Twinkie right there is gonna come back to haunt you for years. So. <laughs> Wrinkles are a sign of wisdom. That, that's true. That's true. Yes. Wrinkles All right. Are good. All right. So true or false? The first microwave oven was called a radar range. True. I know this one because I was reading about microwaves yesterday. And yes, first microwave was invented actually as a result of World War Two, right? One. World well, War One. No, no. World War Two. It was the... World War Two. They were trying to send radar signals to send radio waves more efficiently. Created a magnetron. And then, um, yeah, the the heat heating up food was kind of like a, a nice side effect. That's right. So just at, just after World War II, it was just discovered. So well done, science mom. Excellent. And we have a birthday today. Hooray! So if and given how many people are watching, there should be several other people that share the same birthday in the chat right now. But we want to say happy birthday to JJ. Hey, JJ. Ooh, look at that. You gotta move, got move that way. So oh, that sorry. I was trying to see what he was holding there. It's a cool, a cool little rock that says "No Bullies." JJ, <laughs> we hope you have a fantastic birthday today, and thank you so much for joining us today during quarantine. Do you know how old he is? I believe ten. <gasps> but I had this moment right when I pulled up the picture. Where I was like, "Oh no! What if it's not his tenth birthday? What if it's a different one?" If we got that wrong, we apologize. Either way, have a happy birthday. Yes. Now it is time for a math lesson. If you have other questions about microwaves, keep them coming in the chat and science mom, Liza, Emily, or Krista will forward them to me. And we will have time for just a little bit more discussion about microwaves at the end. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is just talk about how we've, we've talked about histograms, the way that you can display data. We could take a die, a six-sided die, and we could roll it over and over again. So we would keep getting numbers one, two, three, four, five, or six. And that would give us a big list of data. And my question for you, and hopefully you can answer in the chat, is what shape do you think the histogram is going to be? Is it going to be curved in one direction or the other, or will it have a hump in the middle? Like, what type of shape do you, would you expect the histogram to look like if you rolled a die over and over and over? So that, that's my, my first question for you. And we're, just a single die? Yeah, just a single die. Just roll it over and over and record whether you got a one, a two, three, four, five, or six. Ooh, can I answer this one? Yeah, yeah. Let's, so let's see what science mom thinks. My, my guess, because it should be, you know, unless it's like a, a trick cheater dice that has like a heavier weight somewhere to make it get one number more often, you should get a completely flat histogram, if you do it enough, where it would be same chance for all the rolls. Ah. And look and what we I have here. Completely flat, we mean there's subtle variation always. Th th that's true. We wouldn't really expect. So I, I actually did it. I rolled a dice here 600 times, and this is what the histogram came out now, to be. When you say you rolled a dice 600 times, do you mean that you actually rolled a dice 600 times or that you had uh, Desmos do it for you? It, it, maybe Desmos helped a little bit. <laughs> that um, sounds kind of like cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. That's, that, that's being smart. It is being smart. Computer yeah. simulations are very useful. All right. So yeah, but what we what we're seeing there is the the dice were it looks like six was the most common number. Four showed up the least. But look, I'm just going to change it and look, next time. Oh, ooh, ooh. So I can change it and get it to do it over and over again so for me. So you got really close to even. 
yes, yeah, so, so some of these are closer than others, but you're absolutely right. Th this histogram that we would expect would be entirely flat. All right, what happens when we then roll two dice? And, and then adding, and then take their sum. Then what type of shape would you expect? Well, one? then you're going to get seven more often because you can get seven ah. with threes and fours or with twos and fives. Oops. Okay, so let's let's and see what this would look like. Two combinations that can give you seven, you'll get more sevens. All right. I know this from playing Settlers of Catan. Ah, and so here's my simulation. Here is, is how it actually worked out. And indeed, it does seem to be more of a, of a V shape there. And I'll run it a bunch of times. Yeah, it looks like seven is showing up the most almost every time, although a couple times there, six or eight might have overtaken it. But yeah, the twos and twelves are just not very common. So you've got to roll the dice a lot of times if you want to come up with this trend. All right. What and, and that's just because of the combinations, because that's the right. only way that you get a two is if you get a one and a one. Mm -hmm. There's only one combination that will give you that, whereas each of the other ones you get have more combinations. That, that, that's right. And we've we've seen that before. We actually kind of tried to list them all out. All right. What if instead I used three dice and I added them up? Uh, probably similar to that. I've never rolled three dice and added them up, uh -huh. but I bet so. it's. Like you're gonna have numbers in the middle are gonna be more common, right? Yeah, okay, so that, oh. that's one set of data. So I, yeah, I ran this a bunch of times, and yeah, each time we're coming up with shapes that are definitely higher in the middle. Okay, hmm. well how about four times? Or let, let's do four and five, let's, let's do five, and that's as big as I've pre-programmed it for. So we center. All right, so there we are, rolling huh. five dice and taking their sum. Wow, looks like we got 28 several times, more than we got 25 there. That's, that's interesting, that, that's, but if you were to do it again, that would probably yeah. go away. That's just sort of a random Yeah, yeah thing. random artifact, like, yeah. That's kind of cool. Sometimes we got all the way up to, to 30, a couple, yeah. So. Well, I have to get something, I'll be right back. Okay, you, you, you go get something, come, come right back. Oh, I know what she's getting, this, this will be fun. But okay, what I want to point out here is this shape, should be a little bit familiar to you if you were paying attention to my lesson from yesterday. We were talking about bell-shaped curves. And what we're going to see, I'm actually going to resize this guy. Can I? Uh, no, no, in a minute. In a minute. We'll, okay. we'll get to it. All right. So this data should actually follow or start approximating a bell-shaped curve. And so now as I go through, that purple curve, does it do a pretty good job of describing that shape? It does. I would say it does. So what we see here is from a normal distribution, oh, sorry, sorry, from a flat distribution, rolling a die, just adding up dice five times, and we already have a pretty good approximation of a normal curve. If we did added 10 dice or 20 dice, what we would start seeing is, oh, that distribution is really going to look like a bell-shaped curve. Hmm. And yeah, yeah, kind of surprising that it works out so well, but there's a theorem in math called the central limit theorem that just says that as you take the sum of independent random variables, it will approximate a bell curve. And of course, the approximation is better if the data was bell-shaped when we started, but it will always work no matter what the data was like if you add enough things. And that's why we expect height and to be somewhat normally distributed because it's a sum of a bunch of different factors like your, your, your genetics, you've got your diet and other factors that will kind of make it so that height will be normally distributed. All right, you ready for the cool thing? All right, show it to him. Uh, this is a Galton, Galton board, G-A-L-T-O-N, Galton board. So what we have here up at the top, see I've got these little beads that are all gonna fall into this little level here. And then when they start to fall down these pegs, the pegs are gonna randomly distribute the beads. And you can see that the pegs are in sort of this diamond shaped pattern and we're gonna get the most beads falling in the middle. And so they start to cascade through and we end up with a normal curve, a bell shaped curve. And you can do it again and again and it looks a little bit different each time. Excellent. And it's so one, cool. One more time, so fun. All right. It is really cool. And you can see the beads are just falling through, but the way that they fall through randomly 
because they start out from this funnel in the top and it's narrow and they scatter out, you end up with a bell-shaped curve. Every now and then you'll have little peaks that go above the bell-shaped curve and there is one bead in there that is gold and just a little bit bigger and you can look for it and see, ooh, where did it end up? And it usually ends up in the middle, but sometimes it'll be way out to one side. That's right. So these, yeah, these normal curves are going to show up a lot, but we better get it going on to our math mystery. So ooh. turn me around here, please, science mom. All right, so last time we were left with the math mystery of identifying or connecting a grid of points. So I did one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and they should line up in a grid. How do we connect those using four consecutive line segments without lifting our pencil? And let's see if I can do this. I go down to here, up to there, over to here, and then down. So I, I think most solutions are just some slight variation on this guy. So I'm curious, if, let me know in the chat if you were able to figure out th this math mystery. And then I even upped the question and said, all right, what if we did a four by four grid of dots? Could we connect those using six line segments? And in this case, yeah, we're actually gonna kind of cheat and use this uh, as our starting point. I'm gonna just copy what I did before. So that's four line segments, five, six. Ooh, that's pretty cool. Yep. So yes, in indeed. Uh, in general, how many line segments do you need? Well, you'll need, uh, if, if it's n by n, you need two n minus two line segments. And I know how to prove that that's an upper bound, but I'm not quite as sure on how to prove that it's a lower bound. So that's a kind of, kind of a tricky question. All right. And now we have a Minecraft math mystery. We do. We do have a Minecraft math mystery. All right. So you have been commissioned to build a wall for somebody in Minecraft, but they've got very specific specifications. So the cross section of your wall has to satisfy three things. So First of all, the outer uh, layer needs at least one block. Okay. Um, Can I interrupt you really the, fast? Yeah, go ahead. Science mom Emily told me yesterday that it, she wanted to come over and arrange those little magnets that are colorful and were just kind of like all messy here. So look what I did, Matt Dad. They're in a nice little rainbow line now. Ta da! <laughs> Problem solved. Science mom Emily can sleep at night. All right, the wall can be at most nine blocks high. So we're going to limit how high we can go with our wall. And then finally, uh, the cross section must be symmetric. Okay, so let's start out some sample walls. So if it's only one unit wide, well, I guess in that case, we would just stack our blocks. So it's kind of, kind of boring, but you, you could do stacks of size one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. So okay, so the one by one wall, not so exciting, all right? What if it's, it's sorry, the width one wall is not exciting. What about the width two wall? Well, in that case, you know, that was also not so exciting. The square would work, or I could make it go three or four high. That would work, but could I make these two columns different heights according to my rules here, Science Mom? No, because then it wouldn't be symmetric. Yeah, it's got to be symmetric. So if I've got four at this end, I've got to have four at that end. So it'll, it'll start getting more exciting, though, once we get to threes. Ooh. All right, so now what could the wall look like? Well, that's symmetric. There would be a simple wall. Or what else could I do? I could go you could have it higher on the edges and then like have a thing in the middle. Uh huh. I could even do zero in the middle, and I'm going to call this a wall of width three. But the, the, the problem just says that the outer layer needs at least one block. But maybe this one's like a wall with a moat in the middle or something. Aha. Uh -huh. Or, of course, we could 
instead go up higher. So. And so your math mystery question is how many different types of walls did you make? That's right. So the, here, here comes the question. Show it a little bit higher. Yes. How many wall patterns exist? So they just these cross sections for width. Well, one, two, those ones were kind of boring. Well, what about three, four, five, six, seven, or in general, what about N? Like, can you figure out what's the pattern? How many different ways could we design the cross section of the wall according to those three rules? And once again, those three rules were that the outer layer needs at least one block, it has to be symmetric, and um, you can't go more than nine blocks high, otherwise you could just you do this thing to the sky. So that's your math mystery for next time. So you guys are Minecraft experts, but can you think about all the possible wall designs? Awesome. Thank you, Math Dad. Cool. And now we have time for just a little bit of Q&A before we finish with our art showcase showing more dream houses. That's right. I'm singing a song. I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. I bet that there were a lot of people singing along with you when you sang that, and they were all singing the same words because everybody knows the words to this song. I'm bringing families together, but they just come in together and they just start singing. And yeah, I don't know. We 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 have we have mixed reports. We have reports that some people cover their ears every time <laughs> the song plays, and then we have other people who absolutely love it. Uh, I think it all depends. <laughs> Our art prompt for today is to design a futuristic car, and I would say you don't have to be limited just to cars. What do you think transportation will look like thirty years from now? Ooh. And it could be that cars evolve to a new type of car, or it might even be that something else replaces cars. Like a teleporter? Teleporter would be awesome. Or maybe <laughs> like solar-powered hovercraft. Like, I don't know. Um, draw, draw what you think our transportation will be like 30 years from now. And then for the engineering challenge, we have making a wave. And did you bring in our short fail attempt? Oh, I, di I did not. Here, why don't you go grab that real fast while I talk about this. So if you take, whoops, take a piece of tape and then put skewers along the side and you need something that is pretty evenly weighted at the end. And I'd say just use what you have. Find out, you know, what, what you have at home. We had some licorice and that ended up being kind of handy because then we could trim the licorice to make sure that it was more or less balanced. Our fail attempt was toothpicks and scotch tape Whoop, and the clay, some of our clay fell off right there. But the problem with toothpicks and scotch tape is that the tape is a little bit too wide and the toothpicks are not quite long enough. And so if you hold this straight and then try to get a little wave pattern going, you really don't get much happening. Yeah. I, I, I think if we'd made this strip longer. If it was longer, it might maybe, be maybe. But I think I think we ha would have to cut the tape in half if we were using toothpicks. That's my guess. So let's demonstrate our long one. All right, so we're gonna so hold we this have pretty to, tight. You have to hold it pretty tight. And here, come toward me just a little bit, Math Dad, so they can. There we go. All right. You can pull a little bit tighter, even. All right. Moment of truth. We're going to see if it works. I'm going to. Oh, and mine lost one. Yeah, you lost one already. They're, they're too delicious. No, I lost it because it had a little accident earlier. You heard, I don't know if you guys heard, there was this little like thump sound. Um, and that was our tape falling off of the two chairs that we had stretched it between. I'm still going to eat it when I find it. <laughs> I don't really like red licorice. So. These ones are good. These are like super rope stuff. Look at this. This is, this is so cool. So if I push this one down to give it a start, you can see that the wave travels all the way along and then all the way back. And you don't have to make it this long. You can make it even longer. And as long as you have a chair or something else to attach it to so that then you can hold it tight, these are so cool. Really satisfying to watch. Like, really, I could I could stay here for like the next 10 minutes just mm. watching it go. All right, let's give them a front view. Right. You stand back there. So satisfying. There we go.
And you can experiment with the weight of the objects that you have too, like with heavier things versus lighter things will it work. And again, just a strip of tape down the middle. We double taped ours so that it wouldn't be sticky, but you don't even have to do that. I've seen a lot where it's just one strip of tape and then these just resting on top. Pretty so cool. satisfying. So I hope that you will give that engineering challenge a try and let us know what you think. You can share share videos on land, on, on land. Online. Online, which is different than on land. And we need the what's in the bag. Oh. I just had a few reminders in the chat that we that we forgot what's well, in the thank bag. Thank you, thank you. Did I make this one? You made that one. I don't remember okay, seeing okay. that one. All right. People make me, keep me, change me, raise me, even though I can be very dirty. So diapers, the first thing that came to mind, but let me see if that makes sense. People make me, because you make diapers, keep me, like if you have cloth diapers, you keep them, change me, but you don't raise diapers. No. You do not raise diapers. You do not raise diapers. So it, it was a nice try, but um, it falls flat. Yeah. People mm. make me, keep me, change me, and raise me, raise even me. though I can be very dirty. Very dirty? So... Like, would that work for kids? Kids can be dirty. People make kids, keep kids, change kids, and raise kids. But I don't think that fits very well. It's, it's not kids, although, you know, that's not a bad Clothes? Answer. People can make clothes, change clothes, but you don't really raise clothes. Well, no. unless you're, like, hanging them up to dry. Does that count as raising clothes? No, no. Uh, how about money? Money is make, the correct answer. You could make money, keep money, change money, raise money. Dirty money? Yeah. Well, money can be very dirty. Like, are we talking literally, like, germs get on it? I either would actually work. You talk about dirty money that's been unethically acquired, or the yeah, the dollar bills that have been in it's circulation, or coins. They actually the germ factories. So lots of little viruses on those. That, that, that's right. So <laughs> that, 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 was, that was a tricky one. But awesome. Well, well done. Thank you. Thank you in the chat because I I happened to glance money go by. I forget who said it, and I was like, oh, I bet that one's it. How do you raise money? It's like a fundraiser. You're raising money. Yeah. Awesome. All right, couple quick questions. We'll just take three questions before we do our, our showcase. So a really good one was, why do microwave burritos always have cold spots? And the answer has to do with just how thick they are and the way that microwaves work. If you are microwaving a burrito and there is a really cold spot in the middle, you'll have better luck if you microwave your burrito for 30 seconds, then let it sit for two minutes and then microwave it again for the remainder amount of time. Because the way that it heats up, remember, the microwaves don't penetrate more than just a couple centimeters. And the way that it heats up is that the outside has to get warm and then the outside transfers heat to the inside. And so if you heat it up for a little bit, then turn the microwave off and let it sit for two minutes, that heat has time to get in and defrost the inside part and then it will heat up better when you turn the microwave on again. But also I've seen people who threw away their rotating dish and that's bad because then it's all those points of concentration are gonna get lots of yes. heat and and if you have if you have either more chocolate or if you have like a you know a bunch of bread that you can put together, if you cover the whole entire surface of your microwave with some type of food and turn it on, you'll see these patterns, these stripes across the whole entire surface of the microwave. And so that means if you put your frozen burrito right here and you don't have a turntable, then it's not gonna get heated up. And if you if this is the center of your turntable and you put them the burrito there, then it's going to get heated up on the outside, but not on the inside because the inside is staying in this area, which doesn't have as much heat. So often the exact center of your microwave, it's possible that there's a cold spot there. And so if you put things slightly off center in your turntable, they'll heat better. All right. So what does an exclamation point mean next to a number? So if I write four with an exclamation point behind it, they call that four factorial. It means four times three times two times one. If I did nine with an exclamation point, nine factorial, that's nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. So it's a huge number. Huge number. Yep. Last question. How does a microwave melt cheese? And it's because cheese is has a lot of water in it. Most of our foods have a lot of water in them. And so the cheese, when it is at low temperature, then you have those water molecules not moving very much and all of the proteins and things are together in a solid structure. But if you heat up the cheese, the molecules start moving more and you end up with a runny, melty cheese. And it's the water molecules moving in the microwave that heat that up. Excellent questions, you guys. And who invented the microwave? This is a good question. I don't remember. Do you remember Math Dad? I think I mentioned it on the answer sheet. I think it is the, on the answer but sheet. But I, I don't recall off the top of my head. 
just after World War II, there was one individual in particular that's kind of credited with the microwave oven invention. And microwave ovens weren't even really a thing in houses until at least the 1970s, because the first ones were huge. And there's definitely some danger in, involved in, in setting these up. So it took a while for them to figure out the, the process and to make it. And how to make it. Work safely. And not only that, you, Science Mom was telling me that a lot of the early scientists were wigged out. They weren't understanding how microwaves work. It's so the, the level of explanation we gave today is pretty low level. But I mean, there are and much deeper questions that are apparently very difficult even for physicists to understand. When you get inside the magnetron, like the, the why behind why you get this spiral shaped thing of electrons, excited electrons that turns, the why behind that actually gets into some really cool physics. So if you want to go down an interesting rabbit hole, there's a lot to research with how a magnetron works that gets more complicated. But we are out of time and we really want to end with our art showcase. So I'm going to share the screen. So you remind me, so the art prompt for tomorrow, Draw futuristic, a few strict, few strict, car. Yes. Yeah, futuristic car, and then the engineering, engineering challenge. challenge is to make your own wave. Cool. Yep. And on, on Friday, you're doing another painting with a scientist, right? Yes. Okay. All right, so let's see what these so here we go. Art things look like dream house time. So we left off with this one. And now we have ooh, ooh. very nice colors. <laughs> and I like it looks like we've got some cool, cool ways to get from one room to another. That's too. Right. Maybe All these ladders slides. and slides. The, yeah, our house needs more ladders. Oh, I love it. Oh. A creative house by Penelope. Inside of a the giant crayon. Looks like a crayon. <laughs> Very nice. And Edward do, did a mechanical house that can walk. That would be awesome. Whoa. Way better than an RV. Yes, yes. I need one. And then, Jack Lee, we've got a house that comes with a unicorn. Ooh. And if you go through the bottom door, you forget the song. I love it. <laughs> An excellent Minecraft oh, house. Full on Minecraft. I love the hanging lights. That's beautiful in the windows. Boy, that probably took a while. Oh, that's awesome. Very nice. And Lego dream house. <gasps> it has a library and an engineering room. If your house was made of Legos, you're like, you know, I want a room over here. You'd just literally deconstruct a wall and you'd put and it somewhere. Build a new one. Oh. That would be fantastic. Shab. And Kathy did a wonderful house. I love the staircases and the colors and a pool, indoor pool would be wonderful. That's right. Multiple and, levels high. And Graham's got a workshop in his house and a building room. That would be fantastic. Indeed. Oh, a cinema room in this house. Uh -huh. Great work, Ivan. And breeding owls, and it's next to a military base, so you could watch the jets. I love it. Oh, and we've got horses there. And it looks like I came to visit. I like this house yeah, a you lot. Got your very own horse I love there, horses. Huh? Oh, Jaden. Guest bedroom, multiple levels, beautiful. Here we've got a reclining chair and a pool and a hot a tub. Foam pit. A technology lab. Ooh. A sure. foam pit would be super fun. Indeed. I want to go play it. So. Great work, Kyra. Kyra. I love this. Ladder up to the top so you the can sticks, use your roof. Stairway. Oh, yeah. Wow. Our kids would abuse that. Great work, Mario. I love the coloring on this one. Good three D perspective. Yeah. Great perspective here. A little cottage out in the country on a horse, dog, and a cat, and maybe a couple bunnies. Aw. That would go well for you. Yes. Science mode. I, I love animals, although I am allergic to rabbits. My house is full of horses, horses. <laughs> and always has a rainbow over it. Very Beautiful. Nice. Shelby. All right. And, and then Mia, Mia have got a arcade. rock climbing wall. <laughs> rock climbing wall and an arcade. Nice. And a pool. And a maid. And a boy. This is lap you're, you're of luxury. Yeah. yeah. Mia. An indoor playground and a stargazing room. Oh, I love it. A family movie theater. And a library. This is fantastic. <laughs> great, great design. Ooh, and then we've and got another mobile. Yeah, home. like a robot, robot home and elephant. I love it. <laughs> <clears throat> a huge house. Very nice, Andrew. Great work, Stephanie. Oh, I love this one. It's like subterranean and like dug out of a hill. I would definitely like a subterranean house. This one's got a huge elevator. So I don't know if you're trapping down into the earth or way up into the sky, but that's nice. that's nice. Thank you so much to everyone who shared their art. And if you're watching the replay and or if you didn't, you know, turn it in yesterday, but you upload it today, we really love seeing the art. So please, please share it with us, whichever way is most easy for you, because it 
really just brightens up our day to see your creations. And then last, I want to just give a special thank you to everyone who has joined us on Patreon. So $5 a month, that's like paying a dollar per episode, and then all of the rest are free because we do an episode Monday through Friday. And the thing that I think is most amazing is that when you support us on Patreon, it's not just that you're enabling yourself to enjoy the show, but you're enabling hundreds of people to watch it for free. And that's really what we want to do because we know that we're in kind of crazy times right now. And a lot of people aren't able to sign up for another monthly service. And so we really appreciate everyone who has joined us on Patreon helping us to do this so that we can post these worksheets and offer quarantine for free. Thank you. I just want to end. Be careful with your microwave. Don't go crazy <laughs> with, with stuff. But yeah, to try out these experiments, they've been a lot of fun. And let, let us know how it goes. Yep. We'll see you tomorrow.